The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everyone. Sorry for the delay here. We've been working on some technological things. Cheryl, if we can bring up the, the slide deck so everyone can see where we are. Uh, but welcome to the July edition of Digging into the BI. Uh, this is where the members from the Maryland, D.C. and Virginia area get together and look at the latest issue of the Better Investing magazine. Tonight, we're going to be looking at Service First Bank uh, shares, Charles Schwab, Match Group, and Darling Ingredients. And we have four presentations for you. And so let's get started and go to the next slide, please. Here's our standard disclaimer. Uh, this is for educational purposes. We uh, recommend that everyone conduct their own review and analysis. And uh, we may or may not be owning these, present, uh, these securities in our own portfolio or in our club's portfolio. And whatever we show, it's not necessarily an endorsement or promotion of the products either by Better Investing, the local chapters, or by the presenters. It's just what we use to learn and, and participate. So let's go to our next slide. So again, most of you are regulars, as I can see in the audience, but again, we're doing this for people that may not necessarily uh, know what we're doing. So here's who Better Investing is. And throughout this presentation, or uh, throughout this slide deck, you're gonna see these blue underlines, and those are hyperlinks. So you can click on those and you can find out more about us, so the what an investment education organization we are, and what our investment approach is. Those are one and two down there. And again, all of us are from either Maryland, D.C., or Virginia. Um, so you can share this, like I said, with people that are looking to join your club or people that you want to convince of the benefits of this. Let's go to our next slide. And we also have a YouTube channel, and this, this presentation is being recorded and will go up there hopefully tonight at the end of everything. But there's the link for us uh, up on YouTube that you can find. And... Um, you can also just go to YouTube and where I have that uh, green highlight with the arrow going down, just type in digging into BI, you can find it. But do us a favor. If you're there, since you're getting this as a free educational uh, program, go ahead and like the video, each individual video, share it with your friends and subscribe. That's how the algorithm at YouTube uh, works. And everything is designed as chapters. If you see over on the right hand side, that means you can just advance towards the uh, next uh, stock presentation. So if you just want to listen to one of these, again, you can go to that one. Um, and you'll be able to see little dashes, dashes when you're looking at the, uh, the recording of it that will sort of tell you where the next uh, chapter begins. Next slide. So again, um, if you have any things that you need to troubleshoot with your audio or so, We've generally been pretty good uh, for the last couple months on that, uh, but there are some links to where you can find it. Uh, generally, if you're on your computer, use your computer audio, but you can also listen to us on your phone and the like. But again, there's the handouts. They're right down below. We have them today. So we have four completed SSGs as well as a slide deck, and uh, you can be able to take a look at that and do it there. Next slide. And also, if you want to be able to take a look at this, is uh, you can be able to make this image larger so you can see it. Um, you can also do screen captures. We were trying to do the uh, the closed captioning, but we found out that technologically it wasn't working. So we're gonna try, even though it says we're trying to do it, we'll have to postpone that for next month. And it may be able to help people that are hearing impaired or just so that you can be able to understand what's uh, going on. It's kind of a new feature in the newer version of PowerPoint. So uh, let's go to the next slide. And so why are we doing this? Well, we want to be able to show you how to be able to use the SSG and the PERT report. Uh, and this is a way to sort of promote the two uh, chapters in this area, the Maryland and the DC regional. We want to promote our model clubs. And we also have a visit a club program. And it's just a way to sort of do best practices and just sort of help out and to be able to connect with people in Maryland, DC and Virginia. Although I do see people in the audience that aren't from this area, you're certainly welcome. Non-members of Better Investing are certainly welcome. This is the whole idea is to show them how we analyze and look at stocks. And again, if anyone is not a member, you can always give them that hyperlink for the 90-day free trial. Next slide, please. 
And so in just over an hour, we're going to sit there and we're going to go through four presentations, the monthly stock to study, the undervalued feature, and two new stocks that are also found through the BI website. Both of them are going to be found through the screening tool. So we'll show you how we did that. But they can come from any of the things. Basically, it's how to be able to get the full benefit of your Better Investing membership is sort of what we're looking at it for. Next slide, please. So here's how you can be able to find uh, the news releases for where we found it. These these uh, stocks that were the stock to study and undervalued feature were announced back on April 26. Again, this news release page is free for both members and non-members alike. If you just go to the home about us and news releases and you will see it. They already have the ones up for August there too. So let's go to our next slide. And also we talk about this is that if you want to be able to get announcements for what's coming on, uh, if you sign in as a member and where I have the red circle up there for my account, click on that. It will open up over on the left hand side, the my account with your personal information and go to the email and product subscription uh, spot where I have it in the green circle. That will open up and over on the right hand side where I have the green uh, box highlighted. That's where you can be able to change things. You can sign up for your local chapter news. And before you hit the save changes down there, go up and look at the Better Investing Weekly e-newsletter where I have the yellow highlights. And if we go to the next page, we will show you uh, what that looks like. So here's uh, the, this is just for members only, but it will show you some of the stuff that's coming up. We have um, one that caught my eye was the stock up seven deadly biases of stock investors. It's going to be in August on the 10th. And uh, this comes out close of business on Thursday to take a look. And they also have a really cool uh, place to look at stock screens. So if you want to look at some large company stock screens, the blue arrow over there has some that you can take a look at and see how they sort of constructed it. So if you're looking for a, a good stock idea, go there and take a look. Let's go to our next slide. And we're also up on Facebook. This notification went up on Friday. Uh, that's the one up on the top where we have uh, uh, the MIC uh, DC regional. Um, and uh, we can be able to see some of the things that are coming on there. There's also a Maryland chapter uh, Facebook page. And again, this can be shared with members and non-members alike. It's a great way for us to be able to sort of expand our group. And with this, uh, no, we can go to the next slide. Jonathan, if you're uh, ready, I'm going to sort of throw you uh, out there if you want to be able to talk about the stuff from the Maryland chapter with the stock pickers, or I can take over for you. Uh, looks like he's not getting on. Anyway, so this is the stuff that's going on with the Maryland chapter event. They had last week, they had a really good uh, thing that's a review of the top 100 stocks. It's in the annual April uh, Ma uh, Ma Better Investing Magazine. It's the cover story. Um, Roger Cronchi has been doing it about seven or eight years, really well received. And he sort of does a nice analysis of the stocks that are there. Um, so let us, uh, I, I don't know if it's going to be on up on any uh, place for a replay. They talked about doing it, uh, but you can take a look. They also have a stock pickers contest and you can see what's going on right now. The leader as of July 1 is Charles Bright with Bright Ideas. Um, I'm limping in in third place, uh, but we do have uh, my club, Happy Destiny, is uh, not doing so well in this group. So you can sort of see how we've done, but uh, it's great fun. No real money is involved. You create these fictitious portfolios, but it's doing pretty well. Let's go to our next slide. And Cheryl, tell us about the what's going on with the book club. Uh, we have our Money Matters Book Club, uh, which is on the third Tuesday of every month. Uh, it's from 7.30 to 9 p.m. And it's virtual, so you can get it on your computer or whatever you use to tune in virtually. Uh, this coming uh, month in July, we're going to be looking at These Are the Plunderers by Gretchen Morganson. And again, you can tune in. There is the link uh, down below where he says you can be found here. Also, our other discussion topics for the future. And back to you, Kevin. Okay, let's keep moving on. And so here's uh, my club, one of my clubs. This is the Montgomery County Model Investment Club. 
we're going to be meeting on July 19th. There's our link. We've decided to stop uh, even considering going back to the Rockville Library. We're going to be online. There's our link for us. We're going to be looking at how to use a file storage in my iClub for education. And we're going to have a repeat of this service first bank shares. There's a picture of us. We had our, our summer social. Uh, and we combined it with uh, one of our club members is in a second club, Pinnacle, who's presented here several times. And we got together and that's sort of a mix of all of us in the club. Uh, and it was a good time, uh, even though the rain came on Saturday. So it's a nice way, even though we're uh, not uh, meeting in person for our business meetings, to be able to do this as a way to uh, sort of stay connected with one another. So let's go to our next slide. And Cheryl, tell us about your club. Uh, this is one of the clubs that I belong to, uh, is the Model Investment Club of Northern Virginia, otherwise known as McNova. Uh, we are also kind of giving up on going back to our library, uh, so we are going to stay virtual as well. Um, we have 11 part. now we have 12 partners, so I guess we need to update that. Uh, and uh, the 11th of July, which is tomorrow, uh, is our next meeting from 7 to 9 p.m., there is the link, and or you can also dial in using your phone. Education is the fundamental versus technical during stock valuation. The stock that we're studying is paychecks, and we are open to visitors. It's free for you to, to come and listen to how we make the bread, and uh, please do. Okay, uh, Greg, can you tell us about your club? Uh, yes, uh, the club has been in business since 1992. We have 40 members, including student partners. We meet usually the third Saturday of every month, but it kind of changes based on holidays and other things. Uh, I've been in the club since 2004. And so uh, a lot of the members in the Maryland, D.C., Virginia area, there are some members that are outside of the area. I am actually uh, just outside of Rochester, New York. Wow, I didn't realize you were that far away. I thought you were a local guy. <laughs> well, I used to live there. I used to live in Southern Maryland, uh, but not. But it's been a while. Very good. Well, we really like your club. It's uh, it's been very successful, and glad to have you part of us and uh, and the like. Let's go to our next slide. And Ken, why don't you tell us about your club? Okay, so Happy Destiny Investing Club uh, started in two thousand one. Uh, we currently have nine partners. Uh, we meet on the third Friday of each month. <coughs> uh, we, we typically start at 6.30 and go to about uh, 8.30 or 9. Uh, and we've been meeting online. Um, our education for the next meeting will be um, library resources. And uh, we'll be looking at the stocks of URI and APD. Um, Oh, and our new uh, point of contact email is digging into the bi at gmail.com. Yeah, I noticed that I forgot to edit that. Yeah, we moved up from uh, since we went and we go kind of long. We started at 630 so we can get done at a reasonable time. All right, let's go to our next slide and let's keep moving along. Uh, Cheryl, tell us about the visit a club program that both chapters do. Uh, well, this is kind of in two parts. Um, the first is a listing of clubs within our individual chapters um, that are looking for members. And so this is a, a great way for people that are out there, individual investors that are thinking about joining a club. You can look at the list and see if one is in your area. And if it's not even, a lot of them are, are virtual as well as the clubs that we've mentioned so far. So definitely uh, look into it. Uh, the other one is if you have a club and you would like a chapter director to visit you, um, please let us know. Um, we're gonna have some uh, emails later on uh, where you can contact us. And uh, we would love to come out and visit a club. I've done this. Uh, probably about five or six times just in since um, April um, and had really good responses from it. It's it, to do something that would interest and help your club. Um, and so those are the two parts. Very good. All right, let's go to our next slide. So this is digging into the BI. So we ought to be able to look at the uh, magazine. Um, so the 
June, July is a combo. We get 10 issues a year. In fact, I just noticed in my mail today, I already have the August issue in hard copy has shown up. But these things usually show up electronically a couple of weeks in advance. So the August one is already up there. But these are the places where you can see it both on if you have an app or through the e-magazine. And you can see it on your laptop, tablet, smartphone, or any other electronic device. Uh, a way to be able to move away from paper. Uh, let's go to our next slide and let's feature one of the articles that came in. And well, first of all, uh, for the for the featured stocks, for the stock to study and the undervalued feature, what you can do is if you see where that red arrow is, the analyst reports and other resources, that's where you can find additional resources when you are doing the stock to study or the undervalued feature. So to this week, uh, let's back up on that. Um, uh, let's go back to slide 21. Um, so the analysts, there's additional resources for both the Charles Schwab uh, one, which is our stock to study, and Match Group, which is our undervalued feature. And if you want to learn how to use a mobile device, is that green arrow is a way to go. It's a different sign in and log in than what you have for your regular one, but that will walk you through it. So uh, just a thing to consider for the future. Let's go now to slide 22. And so here's a cover story. I thought this was kind of interesting is that they're talking about some of the sectors that are going to be looking good uh, in the upcoming part. In this, they were referencing this book, Invest with the Fed, that has three authors there. And I, I just found it kind of interesting in terms of what they were looking at in terms of what sectors would do well based on what the Fed is doing. And so I, I may not necessarily fully subscribe to that thesis, but it certainly is an interesting way to take a look at it. So go ahead and uh, read that article and uh, maybe you can learn something and share it with your club members or share it with us. Next slide, please. So um, we don't really have many changes from the investor page, but always on page 51 that's there. But Georgia is having their ninth annual investor education fair. It's gonna be in person. I know some of the people from our area are headed down there because you can get a cheap flight down to Atlanta. Um, and it's a nice way to hang out. And I see actually some of the presenters uh, from Georgia are in the audience tonight. So thank you very much. Glad to have you. Let's go to our next slide, please. And let's start talking stock. So we're going to do two in core, service first and then Charles Schwab. So Ken, why don't you get us started and tell us all about uh, service first? Okay, uh, go ahead and uh, let's go to the next slide. All right, so I uh, found uh, this company using the predefined screen on uh, the Better Investing website. Um, I used a, a small company predefined screen, and as you can see, it uh, showed up uh, in the list there. Next slide. Uh, so a bit of a corporate overview, uh, Service First Bank Shares uh, is, a, uh, is a regional bank. Um, uh, it was founded in 2005. Uh, it's out of, uh, they're headquartered in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, and the CEO is uh, Thomas Broughton, who I'll be uh, discussing a little bit later in the presentation. Next slide. So in terms of their corporate footprint, um, they have 29 branches in Alabama, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Tennessee. And then they also have uh, three loan processing offices in Florida and Virginia. Next slide. So um, what's somewhat unique about Service First is that they're a correspondent bank. So what is a correspondent bank? Well, it's a financial institution that acts as a middleman to accomplish transactions on behalf of another financial institution. Um, Correspondent bank accounts provide services like international fund transfers, check clearing services, foreign exchange, treasury, treasury management, trade finance, and liquidity management. Uh, bilateral agreements between the two banks establish uh, the correspondent bank accounts. So the correspondent banking division um, provides an additional uh, stable uh, funding source for the bank, um, which is definitely a positive here. Next slide. Uh, so in looking at their uh, corresponding banking footprint, um, 
they started um, building uh, correspondent banking relationships in 2011 and has grown the number of its corresponding banking relationships to 348 as of March of 2023, um, serving several correspondent banks throughout the United States. Next slide. So uh, taking a look at the balance sheet, as of March of 2023, um, the first deposit mix consists of 68% uh, core deposit accounts, 25% uh, non-interest bearing accounts, and 7% uh, and uh, CDs. And then looking at the loan portfolio, it consists of approximately 50% consumer real estate, 27% commercial and industrial loans, 12% uh, real estate construction loans, 10% consumer mortgage loans, and 1% in consumer loans. Uh, next slide. And then looking at the growth of the balance sheet, um, over the past five years, gross loans and, and total uh, deposits have grown at a compound annual growth rate of 15% and 14% respectively. Next slide. Uh, Service First has a very um, diversified deposit base. As you can see here, uh, a variety of businesses and organizations are represented. Um, their business accounts are primarily from owner managed businesses. 80% um, are commercial and 19% are consumer. Next slide. All right, so um, when you're looking at banks, it's important to look at the efficiency ratio. Um, the efficiency ratio measures the total revenue used to cover non interest expenses. The lower rate, the ratio, the more efficient the operation. Um, it is calculated by dividing the non interest expense by revenue or sales. Ratios below 45% are outstanding. Next slide. So, in looking at the uh, graph here, uh, since 2011, the bank's efficiency uh, ratio has trended well below 45%. As of March 2023, the core efficiency ratio was at 34.6%. Uh, this enables efficient uh, and, and kind of profitable uh, growth for the bank. Next slide. Okay, so uh, the bank CEO, Thomas Rotten, recently appeared on a Trevelyan program, on, which I found on YouTube discussing recipes for success with uh, CEOs of the highest valued banks. Uh, Service First uh, Bank Corps ranked uh, at the top of the list of 13 banks over the, uh, over the, over the past decade um, that was developed by Trevelyan. The list came about when a CEO of a bank wanted to know what were the common traits of highly valued banks. So uh, Mr. Broaden uh, was asked why an active M&A strategy was not a good fit for service first. And here's how he responded. We don't want to outgrow our back office and we don't want to, our service to suffer. An active M&A strategy adds complexity and stress to the bank's back office. Second, uh, we have no expertise in M&A. Uh, what we do best is grow organically. Third, based on what I've observed, Banks with an active M&A uh, strategy tend to grow into mediocre um, sooner or later, uh, become mediocre sooner or later. Fourth, uh, an M&A strategy that may make financial sense, but it does not necessarily make strategic sense. You don't just buy anything to make the numbers on your financial statement dance. And then fifth, uh, although you can fix the credit issues on a balance sheet, you cannot fix the culture of a bank. There's no magic dust that you can uh, fix that that can uh, you can use to fix a bank's culture. So I thought that was an interesting answer as to why they don't um, they prefer to grow organically and they, they really don't um, grow through um, mergers and acquisitions. He did go on to say that he views um, uh, he does not see their business as banking, but developing and growing relationships with people. So I, I thought that was very uh, interesting answer coming from a C CEO. Or, um, but um, I do encourage uh, listening to that video. It gives you some wonderful insights into um, 
the, the regional banking industry and how CEOs see their business. So I would encourage you to listen to that video. Next slide. Um, taking a look at um, the company on Manifest, it has a, a quality score of 99 with a par of 18.8%, um, which is in the, the sweet spot. The financial strength and earnings stability scores are 96 and 92 respectively. Um, when the scores for quality, financial strength, and uh, EPS stability are uh, exceed 200, a score of 225, the company is considered to be a core holding. Also note that uh, SF, uh, the uh, company ranks at the top of the regional banking industry, as well as the financial sector as tracked by Manifest. Next slide. So here are my um, core judgments, um, uh, SSG core uh, judgments. Uh, they're, they're summarized here. Uh, do wanna make you aware that I do have a first cut of this SSG on the Better Investing website. If you want to explore the rationale for these judgments, I would encourage you to uh, read my first cut and you'll, you'll get that insight. Next slide. Um, Based on the recent closing price, Service First is a buy with a 7.3 to 1 upside downside ratio and a potential annual rate of return of 25.7%. It's important to note here that uh, SSG Core does not have, it does have a limitation in that it does not allow you to review trends on return on assets for companies that are in the financial sector. So uh, you, you may want to use the uh, other version of the software if you're, you're willing to uh, looking to evaluate companies in the financial sector. Next slide. As shown here, uh, service first the ratios compare well to uh, the ratios of the, the banks with 10 to 50 billion in assets. Uh, the return on average assets ratio here is at uh, 1.73, which is superb for any bank. Next slide. Uh, Taking a look at the given uh, growth history, Service First has grown its dividend 37% uh, over the last five years and 17% over the last full year. Uh, the company has consistently paid a dividend since 2013. Next slide. So taking a look at things at a glance uh, and review service, uh, First has over uh, 14 billion in assets. Uh, return on average uh, ROAA and, if, and the efficiency ratio is superb at 1.63 uh, and uh, 3.6 respectively, 34.6 uh, respectively. Loan growth, deposit growth, and the EPS growth are all in excess of 14% uh, or better. Um, and then, uh, you know, it, it's uh, a bank that I think is relatively safe from the banking crisis for three reasons. Um, the market is concentrated in the southeastern states, therefore it's safe from spillover effects from the most recent uh, activity in the financial sector. Um, it has not mentioned any exposure to crypto assets or digital tokens in its SEC filings. And then finally, um, unrealized losses on service first bank shares amounted to about 19 million, 1.4% of total equity. If there is a run on deposits, then Service First will have to sell its current securities to, at a loss to repay the depositors. However, this loss is too small to have an, uh, in a material impact on the overall um, assets of the bank. Uh, next slide. So in conclusion, uh, this company is a medium-sized company with impressive book value. Uh, it, I believe it has a it's a disciplined company setting high standards for um, performance. Um, it is undervalued as it's trading below its five-year average PE ratio. Uh, it is a buy at the current price with a 7.3 to one upside downside ratio and 25.7% total return. And I believe it's a uh, candidate worthy of your consideration. Next slide. Thank you, Ken.
And now let's uh, bring in Greg. And uh, thank you, Greg. You're going to be our 19th different presenter this year. So take it away, and you know, let's hear about Charles Schwab. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. And I've figured out how to get my audio straight, so we shouldn't have any echo. So next, so I'm going to be I'm from the Washington Metro Investment Club. I'm going to be looking at Charles Schwab. Next slide. So of course, the question is who is Charles Schwab, that ubiquitous human being that has made all of this money. He was born in Sacramento, earned his MBA, MBA from Stanford. Um, he basically, in 19, he always had issues with the, the fees that brokers charge. And then after uh, the 1975 Security Act Amendment deregulated what brokers could charge, he went into business and made a lot of money. And he's the, uh, one of the richest men in the world, valued at $8.5 billion. So next slide. So let's talk about the company. They're in a multiple, they have their fingers in many uh, financial pies, largest discount security uh, dealer in the United States. And probably one of the biggest things is one, they, they do their business a lot of different ways, uh, you know, through banking, providing advice, uh, and a, a lot of ways. But probably the interesting thing to me is that they rank 10th on the list as the largest bank in the United States. And also, I believe they handle something like 11% of uh, the United States or, or wealth. Uh, next slide, and that might be on the next slide. Yes, over 7. trillion in client assets. And then, yes, estimated 11% of the United States estimated $70 trillion uh, in investable wealth, which is huge. Uh, you know, looking at almost 34 million active accounts. And so they make a lot of their money through their independent advisor firms. Next slide. So, what kind? Of, last year they made 20.8 billion in net revenue. Revenue. So, in broad strokes, you know, 75% was from investor services and 25% was advisory services. But when we look at, uh, you know, in the breakdown, most of their money came from net interest revenue, and of course, then uh, doing services, admin, trading, uh, and then banking and other. And so, when we look at last quarter of they're, uh, they did uh, 5.1 billion. Um, year, it's basically, it was an increase over the previous quarter, which is good. And then the earnings per share jumped up almost 24%. Next slide. So they have a virtuous circle. And basically, it's like we, they want to keep their customers in the long term. And when you look at like their strategies, we say, with the exception of the, uh, their, how they uh, benefit the investors, that area is uh, flat, but in all the other areas there, you know, over 100% growth in the various areas, which is very, very impressive. So next slide, please. So what I did with this particular slide, it took like a 10-year growth pattern, and I just simply skinned it down looking at the first uh, day of the month that it was in the stock, uh, that, that it was open on the stock market. And so you notice back in like uh, 20, June, July of 2011, they were $14.50, and now in July 2nd of this year, they're $56.79. Uh, $56 but really kind of the interesting thing when you begin to look at is that they have the waves of growth. And so you have kind of growth spurt from uh, 2012 to 2016, 2016 to 2019. Then you had a, a peak in, in 2021, and they're going down. And so if you kind of look at their trajectory, you can an anticipate there is, there is going to be another growth coming probably in the next year or two. Next slide. So now we look at uh, kind of like, how do they compare to like the S&P 100, the Dow Jones investment? So they compare very favorably. So you know, if you invested $100 five years ago in the three, uh, Charles Schwab would have come up on top $173. Not a big difference between the, uh, the Dow Jones and 163. But it still, you know, beat the Dow Jones and it certainly uh, beat the S and P 500. So that's, you know, that's very commendable because a lot of companies simply can't say that. Next slide. So here it is when they, when we look at how they compare with their chief competitors. And so the, the I think the slide, the takeaway here is that we see how they started at, you know, five billion and then ended up uh, in 2022 at uh, 20.8 billion. However, we also have to look at that number somewhat cautiously because a lot of that growth was due to uh, acquisition, like at TD Ameritrade and other acquisitions and expanding in other areas. So, but yeah, you know, the fact of the matter is that, you know, nobody else on this chart 
their main competitors have grown essentially fourfold over a period of uh, nine years. Next slide. So here is you know stock earnings, or, you know the the uh, you know sales earnings and price. So basically, the earnings are in twenty. You know, a five-year growth projection is about twenty-four billion. Uh, we're looking at the earnings per share would be about uh, four point three eight, and then we also look at their profit, pre-tax profit. So we think it's going to it's going looks like the future is very very bright. And we look at the historic growth; it's been fifteen point eight, and, and then you look at the numbers here. So all about it's looking very very rosy for this company. Uh, next slide. So here's manager evaluation, and I guess the key takeaway here is we look at uh, continued growth on pre-tax earnings. We're looking at very, very healthy in terms of their earnings. You know, 42.2 percent in terms of pre-tax earnings. That's very, very strong. Uh, we look at their their debt has gone up, but that's partially due to the fact that they've been uh, buying other companies. But yet their uh, their their financial position in terms of their dollars in the bank is very, very strong. And again, we look at strong earnings. Uh, percentage of earned equities almost 25 percent so you know, a solid company next slide please so here you know we'll go to the pre-tax earnings and so again the average uh, earnings uh, price earnings ratio is about 20 percent with the current uh, price of being 15.5 so you know we look at what's going on in the market and where we are you know uh, we've had the, the recent uh, bank situations out in Silicon Valley. We've also had the stock market taking hit as a result of the continued um, uh, federal uh, interest rate hike. And so it's not surprising that their, their earnings per share ratio has gone down over the last uh, 52 months. Next slide. And so when we look at, when we you know take it through the, the five-year risk and rewards, we, we find out basically it falls within the buy zone and uh, very, 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 uh, with a sell zone, which would be some, which a, pr a prediction of, of being about $103, $109 uh, over the next five years, which would be about a 40% increase over its 50, uh, almost actually close to about 80% increase, almost double what its current price is at 56.79. Uh, uh, next slide, please. And so um, here's kind of like looks at what the average, uh, you know, average the forecast range for the PE is uh, 1.3. Uh, we look at like uh, what is the, uh, the average uh, yield using forecast high 1%. And so uh, we, uh, we look at the numbers. The very current yield is 1.8. So the numbers are very very uh, favorable. And so again, annual annualized rate of return is 10%, which is like phenomenal. And then compound annual using forecast high low P P E is like 15%. So very, very strong numbers. Next slide. So in conclusion, you know, a um, couple of things to notice. This year in June, they bought a, a $1 billion, they had a $1 billion stock repurchase. In 2022, they got even more uh, serious and uh, had a $15 billion stock repurchase. They just recently had a Federal uh, Reserve stress test and did extremely well. Morningstar values the company at uh, you know seventy dollars per share. Uh, when I reviewed like some of the forecasts uh, in terms of other members member sentiment in our BI tool, the five year high was one hundred and twenty six uh, to one hundred and twenty four respectively. And so um, people think that it's, it's it's you know we know that these that they they expect the quarter which will be coming on eighteenth to have like not really great numbers. But overall, people think it's a really strong stock to buy. And, and I was just looking at a recent article that thought it was like really undervalued for about 30%. And this was an article uh, by a company, Alpha. So it's a very good, strong investment opportunity, a uh, very solid company, very you know uh, forward thinking, very strong in terms of their cash position. So I, I really like this company a lot. Thank you, Greg, that was great. Enjoyed it very much. So let's go to the next uh, stuff. We're going to now look at two stocks in plus. And to get things going, looking at the undervalued feature for this month will be Match Group. And Ed Rodriguez, take it away. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Ed Rodriguez. So I'm going to be doing Match. Uh, just a little quick point. The actual ticker for it is MTCH. Let's have the next slide. 
So what does Match do? Match, in two words, basically does online dating. It has, as you see in this summary uh, statement down at the bottom, over 45 apps in, uh, in 40 different languages. Um, all of these different apps are highly tailored to different demographics, uh, things like short-term versus long-term relationships, whether you're a younger person or an older, even, even one that's oriented towards uh, folks that have a very strong focus on their career. So if you're interested in dating, uh, they probably have a, a specific app for you. Next slide. So where do the sales come from? Pretty straightforward story here. But overwhelmingly, the money they make is basically payments that the users um, of their apps pay them directly. They have a, a small amount of money that they make uh, from advertising. And in terms of where they're out throughout the world, as I mentioned before, they do 40 different languages, but the overwhelming important place where they do business is here in the United States. 54% um, of their business though is throughout the um, rest of the world, although that's sort of further focused in Europe at 26.6%. The one thing that I found interesting from Match uh, was that it's a really easily understood business model. They have um, they have a variety of different apps. One, you know, probably one tailored to your individual circumstances. They you pay for the service, and they they hope that actually, in contrast to something you heard earlier today, like with um, uh, Schwab where they want to keep their customers forever. In this instance, success is defined by your customer going away. So um, the one thing that helps them is that some of them do come back since sometimes love is not eternal. Next slide. So a few additional facts here. Uh, you could read the items that are in the graphic for yourself, uh, but basically the key point out of here is that they are the dominant player in this field. Um, they have the top app. I mentioned that they have a very wide variety of apps, and those apps have generally been pretty successful. However, as we look at this company from an investing perspective, uh, let's remind you that this is the undervalued uh, featured stock. So um, there are a lot of people that sort of are not in love with this stock right now. Uh, let's take a look at the reason why. Next slide. So what's broken with it? So as you can take a look there at the sales, EPS, and pre-tax profit lines, um, it's not up straight in parallel as, as what we normally want to see in a better investing classic analysis. Uh, fr frankly, it's a mess. Um, if you look a little bit further down on this slide, you'll see the, the roller coaster ride that it's been on since its inception. Over towards the left of that slide, you'll, you'll find a price in the mid-2017. Uh, it's gone all the way up to 169, and now down uh, recently at its all, almost all-time low um, at, at $30.73. So basically, as an undervalued feature, you have to basically ask yourself, um, is this really undervalued with, with a good potential for it to rebound and, and see some brighter days? Or is it a value trap, something in which it's going to stay down in the 30s? I think currently it's like 42 or something, uh, and, and, and not really see much growth going forward. So for this instance, I kind of try to focus on some of the more macro things that might be wrong with with uh, with the match and then try to maybe offer some analysis in terms of are they back on a good track. Next slide. So as I mentioned before, it's sort of hard to do a comprehensive analysis in uh, for a broken stock and also in the 13 minutes that we're given here. So what I've tried to do is highlight a, a few of the specific things that I kind of looked at that I thought might be foundational things that, that have driven the stock down and, um, and, and 
therefore, a little bit later, we'll talk about whether or not they're, they're fixable. So in terms of the problems, let's start with management. And many of you are aware of the basic principle that management of a corporation is a really important thing. You want to have experienced managers. You want to have stability. Uh, unfortunately, you know, Match has had a situation where it's had three CEOs in three years. They've left for a variety of reasons. Um, the most recent CEO actually undertook pretty significant changes in changing the Tinder, which is one of the, well, it's their main app. It's the most popular app. It's the most profitable app. It, they changed the management team and the organization uh, that's associated with that product. Um, let's look at debt load too. So the way Match has predominantly grown is through acquisitions. They do some internal development, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on. But for the most part, they, they do acquisitions. Um, some of them don't go all that great. So, for example, back uh, in, in FY22, there was a you know $270 million write down for, for uh, of a large acquisition. Um, the total debt also since 2015 through 2022 has. Uh, basically doubled, more than doubled. Uh, lastly, this whole area is kind of interesting because there's a lot of competition out there. They're the biggest boys on the block, but unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, but the, the nature of this type of application is that people with a nice idea and some web uh, development, app development skills can kind of create their own app. And uh, so it's easy for people to come up with a new idea and do that. Now, when the ideas are good, you know, match as in the past bought them, but nonetheless, it offers competition and this low barrier of entry is, is, is a problem despite uh, them uh, match having a narrow moat, which generally is a pretty powerful thing. But um, in this instance, instance, low barrier allows niche applications to target maybe even more specific demographics that match has uh, taken a look at. Next. So how do we fix this? How are they kind of addressing it? Or So one thing with the management, this is the one year recently, I guess, it was the one year anniversary for the CEO. This CEO it was an external hire, and he came to match with media and gaming experience. Uh, so I think that is a very positive thing. He was successful in a variety of uh, different companies. Uh, a very important thing he did recently within the last few months is he, he actually made a fairly large stock purchase. That is a very powerful signal when you look at, at, at behavior and whether or not a stock is good. People sell, management sells stocks for a lot of reasons, but they only buy stock for one reason, and this is a pretty positive sign. Uh, also, the team that he's put in for Tinder has been pretty stable. And in regards now to debt load, They've, they've talked in their um, a quarterly conference call about their strategy for what they're going to do with, with capital allocation. One thing that Match is blessed with is actually a pretty significantly rich uh, cash flow. So they do have money to do, to do things with it, whether it's back, buying back stock, acquisitions, debt production. They're going to make a very concerted effort to figure out what's in the best interest of the thing, uh, of, of, their, uh, of their company. Uh, also, they've done some experimentation with how do they squeeze more revenue out of these uh, uh, users of their apps that generally might just want to only use it for free. And a very positive development was that they released a new product, Archer. Uh, that happened about the time that the stock purchases had, so it was a little bit of a bump here. Lastly, the app for everyone. I think this is a very important thing. And if you listen to the the the, the uh, conference call, they kind of bounce around a little bit here. But when you have all these different products, the way they become um, uh, better as a company, more profitable is is by basically operating at scale, basically making sure that they're sharing infrastructure, they're sharing staff, and that allows them to create new applications down the road in much quicker time frames. The other thing that they've been emphasizing is, you know, dating can be pretty dangerous out there, both in terms of just safety and as well as people just not feeling comfortable with that environment. People are lying, you know, they, they put their picture up that it was uh, seven years ago. So they're working for features that I think are going to di differentiate them from the competition. Next. Five minutes, Ed. 
Thank you. So what do the analysts think? In short, we have um, Morningstar, Value Line, and Yahoo all thinking that this is an undervalued place. So I don't think there's much debate on that realm. Next. So what are the key takeaways? So I, I want to emphasize undervalued picks are going to look ugly, right? These are stocks that just don't, are not very, very favorable. They don't look great. I think you guys have just seen service, uh, the first presentation, beautiful charge, beautiful, beautiful uh, consistent performance. This is not what an undervalued stock is going to present you with. So when you are going to invest in them, or at least in the 18-month time frame, which is the criteria for having gains in these uh, stocks, do they have an executable get well strategy? I think I presented some elements of, of this on how they're gonna leverage their narrow moat, how, how their management changes look very optimistic in regards to guiding this company going forward. Next. So nonetheless, let, let's, even though this is ugly, <laughs> let's, let's do a little bit of an analysis in the more traditional BI sense. So. Uh, you can see under number two, you know, this company has in the past been a good business. Uh, just some of the debt that they've taken on and, and uh, maybe not so, and, and the changing an environment has kind of given it some problems here uh, in the last uh, two, three years. Next slide. So if we take a look at the earnings, you can see these numbers as far as high and low PE are all over the place. So even with excluding what I consider to be crazy numbers, uh, if you take a look at the average high PE at 47.4, that's still too high. Next slide. So we used a, a more conservative 40 for any sort of high PE that we might expect. As far as selecting a low price for the stock, I've gone with their recent 52 week low, which as I kind of mentioned before, is really the lowest price in six years. So basically one of my judgments have been is that that is the bottom for this stock. Um, at this point, given given everything that I've I've read and analyzed on it. When you crank the numbers through, this becomes a buy. And on the next slide, we see the graphical representation of where the current price sits relative to the uh, uh, ultimate buy number um, at, at 47.10 versus what it is at now, which is approximately $42.20 with a upside downside ratio of 4.7. Next. So in conclusion, uh, Match is a medium-sized company and its sales and earnings are in flux. And I've used the word ugly and that may be <laughs> intellectually honest to use that phrase. Um, its senior management has been in turmoil, but I, I truly believe that it is back on track now with a, a strong CEO to guide uh, a strong recovery strategy. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it, it seems unambiguous that this is an undervalued stock. The only question is whether or not is it going to recover. Um, based on the analysis that I just discussed briefly, it is a buy up to 47.10. And lastly, I think uh, Match is is a good stock to to take keep keep an eye on. I think there are two reasonable things that you got to look at if you're going to make an investment in this is that you, you have to sort of agree about it having a limited downside. And I think given its position in the field, its history of, of, of execution and the properties that it currently holds, I think that's, that's a valid assumption. And I think based on some of the things that have been uh, problematic that they are in a good position to, to recover from this and, um, Actually, since the article got published in Better Investing, it was pretty close to its all-time low, and it's actually recovered, you know, ten dollars, twelve dollars in the last month or two. Um, that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, we give you the tough ones because we know that uh, you can handle them.
<laughs> All right, and we're going to finish out here with uh, Darling Ingredients. Um, I'm going to be presenting it. It was I found it through the Roster of Quality uh, screen um, and the like. It's also up on First Cut. I've done a First Cut on this, and it's up there. I've also presented this in both of my clubs and in the Mid Michigan Investing Roundtable. Uh, so it's up there quite a bit. So I've done this. It's in one of my clubs and I own it personally. So let's take a look at this and let's go to our next slide. So here's again, I found it on the predefined screen under the roster of quality. If you see that red box in the center there, there's where the predefined screens are. And I highlighted the roster of quality. If you want to always figure out what the metrics are, that blue, that question mark that I have highlighted in the uh, in blue, yeah, it pulls on out and I, I pulled it up and it's in the upper left hand side. You can sort of see the metrics. There were 61 stocks when they did this uh, uh, um, the screen uh, this weekend just to check on it. And this is there were a lot of familiar names. So it's a good place to sort of go fishing for it. And let's go to the next slide and let's take a look at it. So um, here's Darling Ingredients. It's in the S&P Midcap 400. I won't read you everything in there, but what I find kind of interesting, what I sort of look at, and this is a little different than where Ed was, where they've been moving through three different CEOs in three years, is in the middle on the left-hand side, their CEO, Randall uh, Stuhl, uh, has been around since 2023. So it basically means that everything we see on this SSG, he's responsible for. One of the things George Nicholson, our our founder and the person who sort of pushed the SSG for us, he always liked to be able to put a star wherever the uh, the CEO joined on his SSG. He was always doing paper SSGs uh, back in the 90s. And uh, it's a good way to sort of take a look at where they are. This doesn't have a lot of coverage. There's quantitative stuff from CFRA and Morningstar, but there's a nice, uh, the financial health grade that we get in our online tools is average. Uh, but it does have a really good quality score. And as Ken was talking about, this is a really good core score. And there's a potential coiled spring on the value line. And I'll show you that when we get through it. So let's go through to the next slide. And one of the things that's kind of interesting is, is that when I go to the website I, or and I look at their you know, their uh, videos and stuff like that, I should be able to figure out what the company does without having to sort of scratch my head over it. And here's one of the things I found on their about page, which, and this is where they're really pretty good, is they explain what they do, is that they say 50% of the animal makes it to our dinner plate, the other 50% doesn't. And so it can either go into landfills or incineration, or there can be sustainable solutions. And that's where Darling Ingredients is. They're in that innovative and sustainable solutions. So they're the largest publicly traded company that takes over the other 50% of the animal and turns it into valuable ingredients. So let's go to the next slide. And so this is, I won't click, uh, I won't go through this, but this is a seven minute video that I thought was really good. If you download the, um, the, the slide deck for this and you click on this image, you'll go straight to that location. It's, I thought they did a really good job of explaining what they do. And they're featuring some of the more innovative things they're doing to take a look at it. But as Darling says here is that they, they stop a lot of ingredient or organic material from going into landfills more than anyone else. So we'll show you some of the things that they do with our next slide. So again, as I was saying on, on some of the stuff there, they're going to feature the, the food stuff and the fuel stuff, but predominantly what they do is they're really still a feed segment. They still do a lot of animal feed. That's where 65% of their sales are in the upper right-hand side. Um, and you can see they've made three big acquisitions in the past two years in the lower right-hand side. But this Barron's article from June of last month um, was really pointing out sort of the uh, EPA clean fuel uh, rules are stuff that can show that they can be one of this, uh, the winners. And they have a, a, a joint venture with Valero Energy uh, to be able to do renewable diesel. And we'll talk a little bit about that going forward. So it's, uh, they, while they feature the innovative stuff that they're doing with food and fuel, the still core of what they're doing is feed segment, animal feed segment. So keep that in mind. Uh, let's go to our next slide. 
And one of the things to keep in mind when they're talking about animal rendering, they're talking about all that yucky stuff that no one wants to look at. If you remember uh, Upton Sinclair in the Jungle, the book that was written over 100 years ago, where they talk about the meatpacking industry in Chicago, it's all that stuff that's really kind of unsavory. And I really like the, the one up on Wall Street. And you see the hyperlink up at the top. That's an, a, an audio recording of it up on YouTube that you can take a look at. And if you go to the 42-minute mark of that, you can see where they have an attribute of the 13 winning stocks. And I've highlighted this, and that second hyperlink will take you to someone else who sort of went through it. But let's sort of check marks through some of the things that uh, a darling ingredient. The company is, sounds dull and boring. Yes, this does sound dull and boring. The work they do sounds dull and boring. It has a disagreeable function. Who wants to talk about animal rendering and dealing with carcasses and stuff? That's kind of awful. Um, the analysts don't follow it. We just said it has limited analyst coverage. Institutions do own it because it's in the uh, in the S and P 400, so it does have that. But then there's rumors about the company being involved in toxic waste or the mafia. And while this doesn't deal with toxic waste or the mafia, most people would think that animal rendering and the like might as well be toxic waste. So keep that in mind. So there's a lot of things in here that make it kind of like a lot of people won't like it. They'd rather be in like AI or chat GPS or, or any, you know, Tesla and stuff like that. But there can be something to take a look at. So let's go to our next slide. And I was telling you how they do a lot of, uh, um, you know, they take uh, the restaurant grease and uh, used uh, bakery scraps and stuff, and they turn that into valuable things. And this story that was on Inside Edition three and a half years ago, there's the image over on the right-hand side, was showing people that were stealing uh, the restaurant grease that they were getting, usually from Wingstop. They have a big contract with them. Uh, and they, they end up stealing this because they can make the money on it. So they have a URL to help it. They've hired some former Texas Rangers to help them with it. And, um, you know, they're trying to be able to protect that product. Who would think that used restaurant grease would be something that someone would steal? But they can use that to be able to make biodiesel, renewable biodiesel. And that's really kind of cool, um, even though some people are trying to steal it. So let's go to our next slide. And one of the things I like to look at, you know, we can see over on the right hand side, the description from the online tools, uh, where it is and some of their competitors. And we see they have post holdings, that's uh, grape nuts and, and post cereals. You can also see the central garden and pets. Uh, that's two different class, uh, class shares on that one. And that's dealing with pet food and with uh, fertilizer. Those aren't really where darling ingredients are. So what I like to do is I'll search not just under the ticker symbol, but under the name darling ingredients and competitors. And there are a lot of websites that will show up. This one was, I thought, pretty good for finding some of the things. And you can see stuff that may not necessarily be their direct, that are more closer to their direct competitors. We see Cargill is there, but that's privately held. But we see Tyson's Food. We have a Brazilian company in JBS another privately held one in Kemen, and then Dole, which is really more in um, fruits and stuff like that. So we'll go through and I'll show you some of the stocks that I went through. So let's go to our next slide. Five minutes, Kevin. Thank you. And so um, I was looking at some of the, uh, if we look at the pre-tax profit margin, I ended up using Tyson's Food, Archer Daniel Min Midlands, and Bunge. Bunge is, uh, they predominantly do processing of soybeans. Um, so there's a little bit closer to where they are. But in terms of the margin, the pre-tax margin, this one, Darling, really blows away everyone else. Um, Tyson's food is maybe about 60% of where they are. So it's really kind of encouraging to see where they are with this. Let's go to our next slide. And the return on equity, we see ADM, again, they really sort of process grains. They also have a, a commodity trading component that Darling doesn't have. But we can see the return on equity is okay, but not great. It's moved up in the last couple of years. If you look at 21 and 22, uh, Tyson's tends to be a little bit higher on that. And one of the things that return on equity, it can happen is with an increase in debt. And we'll see what the next slide, and let's go there. We'll see the debt to capital has really jumped. And that's because of the acquisitions that they made uh, to like. So Tyson's. Uh, you can see that they're really sort of moving into meat, meat alternatives. 
Um, so this one is a little bit of a concerning the way it's going on. Again, they spent 2.5 billion in sales or acquisitions uh, using cash and cash they really used it by way of uh, debt financing. So let's go to our next slide. So if we look at value line, I was telling you at the beginning, there's a coiled spring. If you see where I have that red circle in there, that, that dot is a current price and that sort of dotted line going through there, that's the cash flow per share. That's a proprietary from value line. When you get something low like that, that can be an opportunity, that can be a buying opportunity. You can see the PEs as value line construction, slightly different than ours. It's at 10.4, and they think it can go up to 18, so this could be an undervalued uh, component. And the same with the relative value. All of those things sort of indicate it could be on sale. But let's go back and let's go to the next slide, and let's look at some of the fundamentals. And here were the things I felt were kind of interesting. They, one of the things Value Line does well is they project out on some of these key metrics going forward. And here you can see the income tax rate is going up. That's not so good. But here's the thing is that as much as the pre-tax profit was going up, it's going to go up even more. They really, Value Line is projecting it. This isn't the company doing it. And then the second thing is if you look at that long-term debt, that if they are thinking that they're going to be able to knock out this debt in about five years' time, even less than that. So there's really sort of a good thing. This is, again, Value Line's projection. This is not the company. And so that's kind of an encouraging sign that they have a method for, for taking that out. So let's go to our next slide. And if we look at the sales growth, I thought I was kind of cautious in some of my sales growth at 9%. I used the preferred procedure and got it to 9%. There is the, the concern with that debt to capital, which I highlighted there. Uh, but the other two look really pretty good. Uh, and just sort of keep that in mind with where we are, that that's, you know, that is one of the cautionary things that are on there. But overall, I think I can feel pretty good about where my number is. Next slide. And if I look at the quarterly data, this is a good way to sort of double check my judgments. My forecasted sales uh, is at solid green line is at 7%. You can see these numbers on the trailing 12 months is 37.5. That's really reflection of some of the acquisitions that came forward. But if you go back before they made these acquisitions, the sales growth is somewhere between 6 and 11%. So I think somewhere around you know, the high single digits is not too far off for a, a good sales growth for this. Let's go to our next slide. Our earning, our PEs historically, I think these are really kind of consistent numbers. I went with 20% for the future high PE and I went with 10 for the future low. And, and we would look at those. Those ended up giving me a buy at, at 4.2 to 1. Um, and I think those numbers are really kind of sustainable. They're not too far out of the market for where they are. Next slide. And so when we look at our five-year potential, it's not paying a dividend now, but Value Line is projecting that somewhere in the next three to five years, they're going to start paying a dividend on top of paying back uh, the debt. Uh, but this is a buy really up to $68.40. It's selling at $62.86. So this is uh, seems to be pretty reasonable, and that total return between 17.1 and 10.6 seems to be pretty reasonable. This isn't a, a get fast kind of one, but this is one that I think has a lot of potential. So let's go into the next slide. Here's again, we can double check some of those things. Again, the capitalization is high. Uh, the, the, uh, the indications that these lines are not consistent is true. So we want to sort of watch this and be a little cautious on it. It's not pie in the sky, but these are things that we'd want to be uh, cautious with as we go forward. But I think we've sort of been able to explain why those lines aren't as straight as they are and why the capitalization is a little high. Let's go to the next slide. So my conclusion, it's a medium steady growth company. I think it's well managed. The debt's a little bit too high, but they have a method for being able to bring that down. It is on sale uh, when we look at this. I think it's on a buy uh, up to 68.40, and it could be a candidate for purchase for yourself when you take a look at it. Next slide, please. So we've done this and we went through these kind of quickly. And what we're gonna do is we're now ask our presenters to be able to talk about where this fits in sort of the life cycle, and if we go to our next slide, 
what we the life cycle is something that comes from T. Rowe Price. We use this as a graphic image that you see in the digital handbook. But T. Rowe Price wrote back that he felt that a company, just like a human being, had sort of a growth and maturity and a decadence. And let's sort of ask our presenters, and we'll start with Ken, why you picked that location for service first. I tossed the star at the chart, and that's where it landed, Kevin. No, just joking. Um, I don't think it's a mature company. Uh, it's certainly not in decline. Um, it's not in the speculative startup phase. So the only logical other area you could possibly place it would be uh, in the in the growth area where where uh, it's been uh, where the star has been placed. So that's why you know I kind of chose that area. Okay, uh, Ed, do you want to tell us about Match and why you picked that location? Sure, Match is in a pretty um fragmented market where there's a lot of different players um there's always competitors coming online i still think there is some good growth available to match by them leveraging their competitive advantage in terms of of having all those properties and maybe getting some economies of scale but it'll be a tough road so i don't think it's going to be explosive growth or very high growth but i think pretty steady and hence kind of being in the middle of mature growth uh, zone there. And Darlene, like I said, it doesn't have spectacular growth, but I think it's beaten down. And I think it still has some really good steady numbers in there. So I have it sort of right in the middle, a little bit closer to the mature growth side. But I think that there's still a good growth story. And they're building out sort of this renewable stuff that, again, they're predominantly a feed company. But they are building out these other things in terms of doing renewables that I, is, can be a good growth stream that they're sort of working on. Greg, you want to tell us why you picked uh, that location for Schwab? Sure. I think Schwab is a mature company, and they continue to grow a lot of it through their services, a lot of it through their uh, acquisitions. And I think they aren't finished growing yet. And when you look at the numbers in particular, and also look at what a lot of other people say, they anticipate uh, continued growth and continued, uh, you know, uh, good things from, from Schwab. So I think it's a very strong company. It's it's not on the stabilization point yet, it's not on the decline, but I think there's probably another five to 10 years of solid growth for um, Schwab. Okay, thank you very much. All right, let's go to our next slide. And it's now time for you to vote. So Cheryl, if you can sort of release the poll and let people get a chance to vote on what they think is best. Um, and while we're doing that, if you have any questions, go ahead and um, either raise your hand or type in the question box and we can be able to take some of those questions as uh, once we're done doing some of this polling. Okay, let's see how we are. We got about 50% of your voting right now. It looks like it's a pretty close vote here. It's getting uh let's see where we are. We're at 77, we're at 83%. Let's see if we can get up a little bit higher. Ooh, we may get our all-time high. We're at 90%. We don't normally get that. Okay. One, two, three. Uh let's close it out. Let's close it out and let's share that with everyone so they can see. And we can see the big winner. Uh Greg, congratulations. First time presenter, and you got the winner, a clear winner. Everyone liked Charles Schwab. So there we are. Uh, Jonathan, do you see any questions or any hands up that we want to be able to share? Again, if, if you haven't done that, go ahead and raise your hand, and Jonathan will help uh, get you involved. I do not see any questions or hands raised at this point. Okay. Um, well, I do see uh, one in here that... Uh, uh, Robert uh, really liked Ed's presentation on that. That's really good. Um, let's see what else we have. Nothing else. Everyone's quiet. Rob, I know you're in the audience there, but uh, we, we did some prep work on Darling Ingredients. Uh, you want to add anything? You did a big, you helped uh, look at this. Um, one of our regular audience members was wanted to be able to understand a little bit more so we had a nice a couple prep sessions on it should we let you uh do you want to add anything rob let me see where you are i can unmute you 
So you're self-muted. So Rob, if you want to unmute yourself um, and and tell us about your your reading of Darling Ingredients, Robert, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I can. Go ahead. Let's hear what you had to say about it. Well, uh, yeah, you spent a lot of time with me showing me your techniques. I did it on my own, and then I, I voted to do spend more time on it okay. during the vote. I um, yeah, I was uh, pretty much turned off with the uh, with the company, but you showed me how to look at it differently. Uh huh. Get 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 away from the the what it does and understand how it well, does what it does. Yeah, but I mean, tell us some of the things that you were sort of. Um cautious or you weren't as bullish as I was on it. I mean, I think it's good for people to hear the back and forth on it. What were some of your cautions? I think it was the debt. And what were some of the other things? Well, debt was one. Um, I, I, uh, you did not feature it, but uh, it has, it's worldwide. It has locations in five continents. I don't know. Most of what they uh, sell is in the U.S. I can't imagine they're sending much buy a ship to the U.S. to make feed. So uh, probably those are smaller portions, but just the feeling of, you know, is is that a secure location politically? Is that, uh, you know, uh, exchange rates? Um, those kind of concerns. So, okay. okay. Very good. Well, yeah, and again, so you weren't as, as bullish on this, and we can see from the uh, vote that it, it wasn't as good as Schwab, so that's fine. And again, it's just sort of a, something to be able to present to people, and uh, some people may like it, and some people may not. Um, thank you very much. Well, I'm going to I'm going to take it, and uh, if you still have me unmuted, I'm going to take it and uh, send it to my my team on my club team. Uh, I told them about it, but if uh, I'll take your presentation which will be up on YouTube and mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, send the location to the team because that's one of the things I I'm doing things for myself that I provided to the team and if the team thinks it's worth the club considering it then it's another step to go to the club mm -hmm. but uh, I, for, I feel more uh, responding to the team Okay. That's and uh, just okay. for people, yeah, thanks, Rob. Uh, and one of the things, just to let you know that uh, Robert's uh, club was featured in the May issue of Digging Into uh, uh, the BI Magazine. So you can read about their club right there. Um, they're over in Virginia. So thank you very, very much. Um, Jonathan, I'm going to uh, mute you now, um, uh, Robert. But uh, Jonathan, do we have any other questions? I don't see any additional questions, and um, uh, yeah, I don't see any additional questions. I don't really see the. I'm not sure if you really made me a host, quite honestly. But anyway. okay, that could be. But um, I, I understand that could be the case. Let me do this. So anyway, um, Cheryl, let's go to the next slide and let's sort of move off of this. Jonathan, I made you an organizer. That's the reason why you couldn't see that. You should okay. be able to see yeah. the questions now. I um, do. I see. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Cheryl, can we move on? Close down the poll and go to our next uh, slide. There we go. All right. Um, so if you have any questions or comments, uh, either to the D.C. chapter or Maryland chapter, there are address, there are email addresses. There's our uh, the email for this uh, program, Digging Into BI. And there's a picture of uh, many of us that have been presenting. Um, and that's us from uh, Bink in Dallas last year. So we're just maybe a year older, except for Cheryl. She's getting younger every day. So uh, anyway, let's go to our next slide. And if you want to be able to receive notices for this, you don't have to be in the DC chapter, but you go to our, um, our, our, our page and sign up for it. We don't bombard you. Our 
Inspire person is in the audience here. Carol does a great job. Thank you, Carol. Uh, but uh, you will get notices on this and other educational events that we're doing. You don't have to be in the DC regional chapter to do it. Let's go to our next slide. Jonathan, you want to take over and tell us a little bit about how people can volunteer? Sure enough. Um, it's um, Better Investing is supported by hundreds, if not thousands, of volunteers that work uh, behind the scenes uh, in every chapter across the nation. And it's a really rewarding experience to volunteer your services. Uh, there are many benefits uh, of volunteering. You can learn new skills. It's really beneficial to educate others. And that's what Better Investing really thrives on. We're sort of a village and it takes a village to educate one another. So that is uh, really, really important for the Better Investing community. And it really is very, very helpful to have people helping other people. And that's where volunteering uh, is extremely invaluable. So if you're interested in volunteering, then uh, you can go to the Better Investing website or contact um, headquarters or your local chapter, or just talk to a fellow member and get more information on that. Thank you. And just to let you, uh, the audience know, Jonathan and another uh, person in the Maryland chapter, Charles, uh, just started uh, today. You're teaching two one-week uh, classes for students at the Howard Community College. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, we just started uh, there's the kids on campus and we have 16 students uh, this week and next week um, teaching them uh, investing using the stock selection guide. So today was our first day. The students ages are between 12 years and 15 years. The bulk of the students are basically middle school, 12 to 13 year old. And so today we covered uh, the SSG. Surprisingly, these kids did absolutely phenomenal today. They completed, um, a, they went through about 50 SSGs. They did complete analysis with judgments on roughly about 20 studies today. Now, granted, they're not doing detailed analysis, nor have we got, gotten into of the background stories and research that will come later on. But our purpose today was to introduce them to identifying high quality companies. And we use the roster of quality companies in the screen. Most of those companies uh, look phenomenal. They're up straight and parallel and um, the quarterly figures look great. And usually management is uh, phenomenal too. So they were actually working with good, high quality companies. And they really did a phenomenal job. We were quite surprised. And so they had great questions and it was a really good first day. So felt really good about that. So. Very good. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, we got to toot your horn. Uh, great to you and Charles for uh, to doing that. Let's go to our next slide. All right, so here's what we're going to be looking at in August. It's going to be August 7th. We got Booking, Skyworks. We're going to do uh, uh, Pyron uh, Network and Visa. And also, if we go to our next slide, I forgot all about this, but, you know, we just got to have more webinars. And in two weeks' time, what we're going to do is we're going to have some of our uh, presenters from 2022 look at some of those stocks that did really well or uh, maybe not so well uh, in the that were presented from January 22 to uh, to December of 2022, and see how they look somewhere between you know six months to the past 18 months. We have some winners and some losers. Um, it's not so much a portfolio, but we are we will go back and sort of ask our presenters if the thesis still holds or if something changed or what we missed on that. It's a way to sort of practice and improve our judgments. So come and join us. We'll have to make sure we get a notice out for that. Um, so I, I guess I have to reach out to our Inspire person for that. Next slide. And you can see all the stocks that we presented uh, up on Manifest. You don't have to be a, a, a have a membership at Manifest to be able to see these. These are all public dashboards. You can see all the different ones I've created for this. 
Let's go to our next slide. And again, with the handouts, those are all hyperlinks that are active. You can go straight there to take a look at them. I'll update it with the, the winner for tonight uh, to see there. And you can just sort of see it's just sort of a tracking as if, you know, we had a fake $100 in each one of those, how they'd be performing to, to do it. Um, so just a, a good quick way to sort of examine it and see which ones are doing well and which ones haven't. Next slide. So again, we'll have everything up on YouTube, hopefully later on tonight. There's the hyperlink for that. Uh, Jonathan, one last time, any questions? We've had people really quiet the last couple months. No one really wants to sort there, of jump in. There is a question from Reddy who's uh, asking how to uh, request to be on the monthly meetings, um, how to sign up for the meetings. Okay. Uh, Cheryl, you want to back us up to the DC regional page? I think it's about four or five back. 98. Slide 98. There we go. Thanks, Ed. Back two more. There we are. So, um, yeah, the way you can go here is if you go to the DC regional chapter. And if you see on this page on slide 98, that's the link up there. So it's betterinvesting.org forward slash chapters forward slash DC hyphen regional. And if you sign up there, put in your name and email. And again, you don't have to be a BI member. You don't have to be in the DC regional chapter. You will get notices for this and you can be able to have, uh, you know, ask anyone in your club or potential people uh, that may want to join your club to be able to get this. We don't inundate you with a whole bunch of uh, emails. It's usually just always educational things that are going on. Um, so if you want to learn more about long-term better investing, uh, we have a book club that, uh, a book discussion club, as well as sometimes we'll alert you to things that are going on in our model clubs. And sometimes we have some outside speakers. So place to be able to find it is all right there. Anything else do we have, Jonathan? No, that looks like um, we have um, completed all the questions. Okay. Well, with that, uh, it's pretty much where we like to sort of finish off here. We got it done in 90 minutes. So thank you very much. Come back in two weeks' time when we sit there and we'll do a review of some of the more interesting stocks from last year, see what we learned, what we could do better. And then a month from now, three weeks from now, four weeks, I think, uh, we'll be back in August. So thank you for being here. And please make sure to dig into your BI. Good night, all. And I'd also like to remind everybody to please uh, get the handouts. Uh, and that will help you if you're looking at it later on on YouTube. Good night, all.